Not so recently, Boku no Hero Academia completed one of its most intriguing arcs. Very questionable creative decisions were made and, for better or worse, Horikoshi inserted new elements that completely changed the course of the story. There were surprises and disappointments. However, the fight between the League of Villains and the Meta Liberation Army enriched the narrative in an unprecedented way. Here I will analyze all the attributes that most caught my attention during the villain arc, and try to demonstrate how the author was able to write a story far above what is expected from an action manga. With that said, let's get started. It is quite clear that Horikoshi loves to vary and explore different genres throughout his work. In the pro-hero arc, for example, we were introduced to a family drama focused on Endeavor. The UA School Festival arc brought us a slice-of-life story based on Jiro's personal struggles. There was also the epic Hideout Raid arc, whose events signaled the change of tone that the story would have from then on. We even had a short comedy session with Todoroki and Bakugo right after the Shihai Saikai arc which was an intense police investigation tale about the Japanese Mafia in the universe of the series. However, what all these arcs have in common is the climax, which always results in some sort of confrontation. That's obvious, after all, Boku no Hero Academia is, above all else, a shonen. Fights are a necessary factor in keeping readers engaged with the narrative. However, I find it interesting that the arc whose structure most resembles that of a conventional battle manga is aimed at the villains. The classic formula in which a group of young people must defeat a major threat as they evolve their powers and receive flashbacks in the middle of a war has never been more evident. Now, of course, this was not the first time the series used traditional narrative tools of the genre, but the identity of the arc is directly related to the fact that the villains are leading a shonen adventure. Perhaps there is a reason behind this, especially if you consider the events of the previous arc. The joint training arc suffered several pacing problems. The number of pages per chapter decreased considerably over the weeks, and, in addition, the author had to take some breaks. It was painful to follow the development of UA first years in such a dragging way. To make things worse, there was also the Six Quirks fiasco, which completely divided the fandom. Many were concerned about the big reveal, as they interpreted it as a sign that the power scale was going crazy and the series was doomed to only get worse over time. It was a difficult experience for the readers, no doubt. I mean, at least in the West, this arc was not very well received. To compensate for this disappointment, it would be necessary for the author to give his fans something that could assure them of the series' quality consistency. Horikoshi then took the easy route. He designed a relatively simple, basic shonen arc and chose the Metal Liberation Army, an organization that had already been mentioned in the series, to antagonize the main cast in this section of the story, which gave it a good deal of hype. However, to guarantee even more its success, the author decided to switch sides and tell the story from a new perspective. After being criticized for having weighed too much the balance in favor of the heroes, Horikoshi immediately delivered an immeasurable power to the League of Villains. However, from a critical point of view, I would say the arc in question is somewhat exaggerated in its entirety. The notion that six people can resist the murderous intentions of an entire urban population is undeniably absurd. Even by the series standards, this war against a gang of criminals seems unnecessarily hyperbolic. I would even say that the individual confrontations of the arc, unfortunately, left something to be desired as well. Twice didn't even face Skeptic directly, the fight between Getin and Davi didn't add up to anything, and most of the fights were concluded in an extremely abrupt way. Not to mention other equally frustrating details, such as Redestro's armor that was barely even used, and the vague participation of Giganto Maki in the final fight. And personally, I also didn't really like how the author took advantage of this arc to advertise the second anime film. In any case, these failures are compensated by the general execution of the arc, which fulfilled its function better than any other in the series. The plot itself may not be the best, but it fits perfectly in its narrative context. The story is clearly building up as it sets the stage for a huge clash to come. The excessive grandeur of the arc is a way of highlighting the magnitude of its events for the story's future. The battle against the Liberation Front is essential for the series' main villains to become a greater threat than ever. This arc is nothing more than a promise, brilliantly expressed to readers through a war starred only by the villains. 
It is a means of anticipating the greater danger that the heroes will eventually face, and the author has demonstrated this in a surprisingly bold and unusual way. The Meta Liberation Army arc is impressive in many ways, but what attracted me the most was how Horikoshi managed to create something truly different and unique at a time where originality is lacking. Another factor that impressed me a lot was the way he developed the League. After all, let's face it, the gang has always been a little incompetent throughout the series. Most of the group's attacks resulted in costly losses and provided very little profit. This is because the leadership of the team has always been in the hands of Shigaraki, a childish and unmotivated young man unable to reproduce the same intimidating presence as that of his master. However, the character has clearly been changing over time and the villain arc certainly marks a peak in his evolution. Tomura's transformation was certainly planned from the beginning by the author, and this is evident through the League's subtle growth in the story. There were other villains in the series who didn't belong to the Shigaraki's gang and yet represent an obstacle for both the heroes and the League. It's as if both the good guys and the bad guys are using the same resources to build a ladder. Harikoshi wants to make it clear to the readers that all the secondary threats of his work have the narrative function of evolving both the heroes and the villains. And it is precisely this parallel development that makes possible the existence of an arc focused solemnly on the bad guys of the series. If the League of Villains had been an imminent force right off the bat, the arc would probably not have been as successful and could have even led to the cancellation of the manga. The confrontation between classes 1A and 1B had already caused a lot of controversy. And even so, the other had the balls to bet on an exceptionally singular concept. It's no easy task keeping the readers interested in a completely different perspective from the usual one for about 5 months. The other found a way to innovate the classic with his villains, and because of that, Horikoshi strengthened my respect for him through this arc. Even though not all the League members were properly developed throughout the villain arc, they still have enough attributes to stand out in the narrative. Mr. Compress, for example, is extremely expressive if we pay attention to his journey as a character. He uses his masks to represent the variation of his emotional state during the story, and in this arc, the magician finally went back to using the mask he wore for the first time when he debuted in the series. In addition, he expressed the League's conditions and needs through his unquestionable longing for sushi, which turned out to be irrelevant in the end. When the group finally got the meal they wanted so much, the arc concluded. The acquisition of sushi is what connects the prologue to the epilogue of this part of the story. Mr. Compress' desire indirectly verbalizes the evolution of the League of Villains, just as his mask signals a new beginning for him and the group itself. However, when it comes to character development, he himself has not changed much. I imagine that the other is saving his moment for another occasion. Another character that hasn't had his chance to shine yet is Dabi. In the battle, he only served to hold Apocrypha, a great soldier from the Liberation Front. However, it was interesting to watch him face someone with a quirk similar to that of his younger brother, Shoto. And yes, I'll be assuming Dabi is a Todoroki because, come on, of course he is. Anyway, not only that, but Getin follows the ideals that Endeavor once followed as well. The notion that strong quirks are more important than anything else is a style of thinking that Dabi despises. And interestingly, unlike Dabi and Shoto, Apocrypha embraces his position as someone that is being used for a specific cause. So it will be fun to follow the dynamics between Dabi and Geten from here on out, since they are allies now. Anyway, although the fight between the two did not receive the attention it deserved, Dabi was nevertheless a relevant piece for the conclusion of the arc. He was the one who formed the main bridge between Hawks and the Paranormal Liberation Front, which will certainly have catastrophic repercussions in the future. After all, Hawks' admiration for Endeavor forms a remarkable symbolism in relation to the tale of Icarus, a character in Greek mythology known for his careless actions. Wherever he is, Hawks will always be flying too close to the sun, be it Endeavor or his firstborn, Toya. In conclusion, Dobby's actions in this arc were designed to be relevant in the long run. However, among the secondary members of the League, the one who stood out the most was, without a doubt, Spinner. Iguchi provided this arc's narrative focus and was genuinely developed throughout it. He assumed the position of narrator and played a very important role. Especially if we consider the nickname of this arc, My Villain Academia. That title is there for a reason. The name represents not only the obvious inversion of protagonists at this point in the story, but also a distorted version of the teachings of the hero school. Take Shigaraki for example. 
For him, everything is just a video game. In this arc, the character acquires experience through the servants of All for One, so he can pass the phases of his private academy, so to speak. Before becoming the king of the underworld, Shigaraki must learn to be a respectable villain. This entire arc symbolizes a kind of final test for the League, and no one would be able to demonstrate this better than Spinner. The character finally overcame his vague inspiration influenced by Stain and decided that he wants to be part of the Villain Academy. Iguchi represents the ordinary lower class citizens unhappy with society, and he is there to verbalize how Tomura's goals can be as inspiring as those of the hero killer. Well, at least within the universe of the series. After all, unlike Stain, Spinner spent time with Shigaraki. They lived together, they fought together. As a result, Iguchi was able to see the ambition in the eyes of his leader and contemplate the future he envisioned. Spinner saw with his own eyes the landscape that Shigaraki promised, a vast and destroyed horizon. So, in this arc, Iguchi gained the strength to fight for a cause and became one of Shigaraki's most loyal allies. Among the members of the group, Spinner was the one who mentally matured the most because he learned to respect his leader. Since the beginning, he was the only one who listened to Tomoru's words and showed a legitimate interest in the gang's ideals. The League represents a real school for Iguchi, who is still learning the ways of villainy. This is Spinner's villain academy more than any other member. And that's why there's no one more suitable than him to narrate this arc. Toga received a curious development in this arc. The fight against Kizuki has subtly deepened the reasons why the character is obsessed with the relationship between Midoriya and Ochako. There is a very strong physical resemblance between Deku and Saito, the girl's first victim. Himiko projects the distorted attraction she had for her classmate in Ochako's admiration for Midoriya. It's a fun parallel created by the author, but there's a more interesting aspect to the way he explored the yandere. The character introduced us to a new concept in the series universe, the evolution of quirks. In fact, the entire arc has a great debate around special abilities and how they are treated in society. According to Redestro, quirks are directly linked to a person's character, and we see an extreme case of this in Toga herself. The character shows a sick and disturbing interest in blood, but that is naturally part of who she is. Because of this, Kizuki wants to take advantage of the girl's case to prove to people that the mere existence of quirks is already a contributing factor to the increase of crimes in Japan. For the Liberation Front, the Hero Society manufactures its own villains just by restricting the special abilities, which is one more reason to liberate them. Kizuki says that if it weren't for the current loss, Toga could have had a normal life. However, in the girl's eyes, her lifestyle is as normal as any other. This contrast leads us to question even more the existence of superpowers as something exciting. If we think about it, most of the series conflicts are directly related to quirks. The lack of a special ability was what morally depressed Midoriya in his childhood. The possession of a strong quirk contributed a lot to the problematic formation of Bakugo. The colleagues of Shinzo misjudged him due to the nature of his superpower. Todoroki restricted himself from using his fire powers due to his father's blind search for a powerful hair. Ultimately, everything revolves around quirks, and nobody exemplifies this idea as perfectly as Toga. The character portrays very well the theme of freedom present throughout the arc. She suffered because of her parents' constant repression over her quirk, and the release of her special ability was what led her to ecstasy. Only when the characters overcome some sort of emotional barrier do they break the brakes and awake their quirk. It was like that with Twice and Shigaraki as well. The evolution of special abilities represents happiness for these characters. However, this does not mean the breaks no longer exist, they just have been updated alongside their respective evolutions. Horikoshi has always been very good at dealing with limitations. Deku, for example, used his Black Whip for literally one second and realized right away that he still couldn't use it in its entirety. Toga can utilize the quirk of the person she transforms herself into, but this also minimizes the time she is able to maintain that form. Twice is now able to create a gigantic army, but the greater the number of clones, each copy is considerably much weaker. Shigaraki has enough power to crush an entire city, but in doing so, he suffers a noticeable amount of damage and if he's not careful, he could even disintegrate himself in the process. The author was able to better contextualize the evolution of quirks in this arc, which was a tremendous relief for the readers. The great confrontation between the League of Villains and the Meta Liberation Army introduced a renewal of quirks. 
The concept may even have been an asshole, but the development employed on the idea made the experience much more digestible over the course of the story. Himiko Toga debuted the awakening of special abilities in a violently sudden way, which was also fascinating. The character does not follow the ideals of the hero killer and couldn't care less about society. All the girl wants is an easy life where she's able to enjoy herself without having to control her impulses. And if the only way to find happiness is to enter the world of villainy, she will gladly accept this route as her normal life. Twice is a disturbed character, haunted by madness and despair. In this arc, he had to overcome his fears and face the past through skeptics' puppets. Horikoshi even named one of the chapters of this event in reference to one of the Joker's most classic phrases, all it takes is one bad day. This in itself is already very interesting, makes us question whether the other had any other intention besides paying tribute to Batman. In fact, if we pay attention, the entire arc revolves around a huge bad day. It's a horrible day for the League of Villains, which turns out to be a terrible day for the Liberation Front as well. And from a broader perspective, it is also a bad day for the heroes due to the birth of the Paranormal Liberation Front. Horikoshi also created several visual rhymes referring to the killing joke throughout the arc, and even titled an entire volume after the villain's sentence. However, while Alan Moore emphasizes in his work the irony of two crazy people being unable to help each other, Horikoshi demonstrates the opposite in his character Jin, who was able to find comfort in the League of Villains. Shigaraki and his companions were able to come together due to a genuine feeling of affection that has been created between them over time. However, the one who most values this bond between them is Twice, and for this reason he is the most appropriate character to star this section of the story. So, in a way, Horikoshi's interpretation is much more optimistic if compared to Alan Moore's. Another character that also resembles the image of the Joker is Redestro. I don't think I even need to explain why. His appearance sums up the vile atmosphere present throughout the arc quite appropriately. Both Redestro and Twice are characters strongly influenced by society. What sets the two apart, however, is the fact that Jin recognizes his condition as someone who does not fit the system, while Rikia genuinely believes in his political position and aims to reform society. That's why, from a narrative standpoint, the confrontation between the two characters in the tower is one of the most interesting moments of the arc. Twice is a direct consequence of society's injustices, while Redestro represents an extremist ideological bubble. In contrast to Toga, who provided the readers with a new perspective on the exploration of quirks in the series, Jin presented us with a more complex view on society in relation to the League of Villains. He found a home among other outcasts who also went through bad days, and is willing to risk his life to rescue the man who gave him the hope he has always sought. Bubagawara's eagerness to come from the Liberation Front is purely emotional and not rational at all. However, among the members of the League, his reasons are the most empathetic. Shigaraki sees the situation as an opportunity to beat Gigantomachia, while his allies are merely following the leader's orders. The motivation to save Giran, however, is much more accessible to readers. Jin is the villain's comic relief, the friendliest and the most human of the group. Because of that, the character alone makes us cheer for the League. He doesn't provide the narrative focus of the arc, but he considerably favors the empathy of the reader towards the villains. And it doesn't stop there. Twice was the one who gave his team the reinforcements they needed, a game-changing army. His participation was fundamental in this battle, because, until the moment of his evolution, the narrative excuse that was being used to justify the League's resistance in the war was a little sloppy. Before Redestro's call, the gang members had been improving their skills through the restless struggle they were having against Gigantomachia. And despite their circumstances, no one died of exhaustion during this period? It's an extremely unlikely scenario, but nothing too absurd if you consider the fact that the humans in the story seem to have much more stamina than normal. Furthermore, it's no use trying to find total realism in a shonen. Anyway, the point here is that it was precisely the precarious conditions of the League that made it possible for them to win. Redestro's plan backfired as he did not imagine that his trap could strengthen the group's mental state rather than oppress it. Even though they were poor, weak and exhausted, they all managed to withstand the Liberation Front's attack for an entire hour. However, all this effort would have been in vain had it not been for Twice, who received the little push necessary to overcome his limits and unlock the true potential of his quirk. 
Consequentially, Bubei Gawara finally paid his debt to the gang. Jin is the one-man army of the League of Villains, the hero of the Metal Liberation Army arc, and a force to be reckoned with. Tenko Shimura Origin Part 2 This chapter contains possibly the most brutal sequence of the entire work. Up to that point, the end of the previous chapter had already made it very clear what was going to happen. With this, the author had two options. To show nothing, after all the information that Shigaraki had murdered his entire family had already been revealed, or to show what happened despite not needing to, as it would be redundant. Horikoshi chose the second option, but the way he executed this segment was so masterful that it got impossible to say there are no layers to it. Firstly, let's look at the deaths that followed and try to understand what Tenko's real intentions were. The dog and the sister died by chance. Tenko legitimately had no idea what was going on. In his eyes, Hana was a coward for not bearing the consequences of her actions, so she died doing what she did best, running away. However, she was the only one who gave him moral support and apologized. Not only that, but she also shared the same position as her brother, as they both feared their father. Her death, like that of the dog, was accidental. Regarding his mother and grandparents, he was not sure, but it's implied he already suspected his own murderous intentions. If we look closely at the first panel on page 9, it looks like one of the mother's hands is covering a wicked smile on her son's face. Horikoshi gives us to understand that, at the time, Tenko tried to convince himself that he didn't want to have killed his family. While in the present, Shigaraki seems to finally recognize reality. Deep down, he enjoyed what he did. His family members clearly did not agree with Kotaro's ideals, and yet no one came to the boy when he needed it most. For a five-year-old, this is synonymous with betrayal. His grandparents always seemed indifferent to their son-in-law's actions, so their death stayed in the background, demonstrating that their absence makes no difference. And although his mother gave him lots of love and affection, she chose his father's side. Tenko was unable to understand why she defended him. The boy's envy is evident, which introduces a clear Oedipus complex into the narrative. After all, the only one intentionally murdered by his own son was none other than Kotaro. Putting these things in perspective, we can see how this was all a big domino effect. Kotaro, ironically, also suffered because of a complex he had with his mother. Nana left her son for adoption, which caused him to maintain an intense hatred against hero society. Subsequently, this hatred would be projected into the rules of his house, along with the fear of losing another family member again. To protect everyone, he made the decision to never talk about heroes again. Kotaro probably felt like he was doing something for the greater good, the classic I'm doing this because I love you kind of thing. Unfortunately, his fear only caused more hatred and anguish within Tenko's little heart. When Kotaro finally realized he was doing something wrong and decided to change his actions to build a happy family that his mother and wife always dreamed of, it was too late. We can see a pattern here. These deaths are aligned in order of who Tenko found guilty for not having protected him. This whole frustration towards his relatives resulted in an intense inner hatred, and that was what blossomed his quirk. This is symbolically represented with the house his father built going down, and his itch finally disappearing. Thus, the main villain of the series is born, Shigaraki. In a way, chapter 236 can even be considered forced. Moonchan's existence, for example, is somewhat unnecessary. The animal clearly serves only as a narrative tool to enhance the tragedy on the scene. However, as the chapter's intention is precisely to emphasize the horror present in Shigaraki's childhood, I think I understand the author's decision. In the end, Horikoshi contextualized Shigaraki's behavior as a spoiled boy who wants to destroy the things he hates, while telling a fascinating family tragedy. The rough and coarse line of the drawings alongside the narrow panels throughout the chapter are very different from the visual style that is normally expected from the work. In particular, page 14 reminded me a lot of the drawings by Junji Ito, a renowned horror manga author. Madness and terror are clearly exposed on the child's face in a very sinister way. It is a frightening illustration. 
What the other developed here was a very dark, bloody and melancholic graphic show with the purpose of demonstrating the loss of humanity from its main villain. Chapter 236 is phenomenal and undoubtedly one of the best in the work. With the revelation of Shigaraki's past, it became easy to draw several parallels between him and other characters. After all, themes of family misfortune are nothing new in the series. The conditions of the Todoroki family, for example, allude to Tenko's childhood. Like Eri, Tomura developed a rare quirk and accidentally killed his family. You can even relate him to Bakugo. Both grew up in a problematic household and Shigaraki prematurely considered Bakugo to be interested in his cause as the anger and hatred in the boy's heart reminded him of himself. Anyway, the most apparent parallels in this arc were, without a doubt, those between Tomura and Midoriya. The similarities between the two had already been established in the work. Both are nerds, wear red shoes, and were chosen to inherit a great power. This connection is especially pronounced in the overhaul arc, where both characters had to face someone who was, supposedly, a better candidate to succeed their respective mentors. On one hand, we had Chisaki, a much darker, colder and ambitious villain who challenged Shigaraki's reckless and hasty ways. On the other hand, we had Mirio, an exceptionally good natured and charismatic student who tested Deku's dreamy spirit. Both the hero and the villain needed to prove that they are worthy of their position. At the end of the arc, Chisaki and Mirio got screwed being no longer able to use their powers. However, if after the Yakuza tale there were still doubts that Tomura and Deku reflect each other, these last events in the manga left the comparison being inevitable. The conclusion of the villain arc includes several visual rhymes that evoke past events, starting with the character design itself. It's impossible not to notice the similarity between Tenko and Midoriya as children. Their faces and hair are very similar. Both wanted to be heroes, and not only that, but their sentimentality is quite highlighted. After Shigaraki used his super attack to destroy Deka City, his right arm was severely injured, notably resembling Deku's after his fight against Muscular. In fact, Redestro and Muscular are physically similar figures when in combat position. Another element that further strengthened the idea of an inevitable confrontation between the two in the future was the revelation behind the name Shigaraki. During the flashback in chapter 237, it's revealed that Shigaraki is actually the surname of All for One. So, just as Midoriya and Tomura are connected to the Shimura family, both are also connected to the Shigaraki family. This connection emphasizes that both could have taken a different path had it not been for the minor complications of destiny. Unfortunately, it was not Deku who reached out to Tenko, it was all for one. And just as Deku saw hope in Toshinori, Tomura saw the same in Shigaraki. Another interesting detail that can be pointed out between these lineages is the image of the smile, which is obviously a very important factor throughout the entire work. It primarily represents hope, but it can also represent madness. Shigaraki, our main villain, smiles on several occasions, and I feel like this serves to illustrate his origin. The character is a descendant of All Might's predecessor, and because of that, he shares several similarities to her. For example, Nana advised Toshinori to remember his origin if he was in a difficult situation, and that is exactly what Tomura does in his fight against Redestro, like grandma, like grandson. The relationships between good guy and bad guy, successor and predecessor, master and apprentice are endless in Boku no Hero Academia. I wouldn't be able to list all of them even if I wanted to. Of course, this is nothing new or original, it's obviously not the first time that any work draws parallels between the good guy and the bad guy. I just wanted to emphasize here the fact that several of the connections between Deku and Shigaraki became more notorious thanks to the villain arc. They were always present, of course, but it was only in this arc that we had a direct confirmation by the author. The Metal Liberation Army wants to abolish laws that restrict quirks. It's an extremist group that intends to restructure the current system of society, favoring quirks and their users. Those without special abilities would benefit the least, so to speak. For a long time, this organization was led by Chikara Yotsubashi, also known as Destro. 
However, with the rise of All Might, the group began to act in the shadows. Chikara passed away and the leadership of the army was inherited by Rikia Yotsubashi, his son, also known as Reed Destro. Now, Rikia is an intriguing fellow. He was trained to be a leader and carries the weight of the Liberation Front on his back since he was a child. And although he believes strongly in his father's ideals, he does not consider himself to be free. After all, Redestro dedicated his life and quirk only to the Liberation Army. In his eyes, his father's legacy is a burden to bear, there is an evident contradiction here. It's important to notice this as it strengthens the reasons why Rikia presents Tomura with the Liberation Front. The story makes it clear that Redestro didn't appreciate his role and emphasizes his happiness in giving up the responsibility he never asked for. However, what made him make that decision? To answer that question, we need to better understand Shigaraki's situation. For a long time, Tomura unconsciously deprived himself of his memories because he was afraid to face reality and admit his psychopathic intentions. However, Redestro, by destroying the hands of the Shimura family, breaks Shigaraki's emotional locks and throws him into the past. After winning his memories back and remembering the words of 0 for 1, Tomura reinterprets his story. What happened was not a tragedy, it was a pleasure. With that, Shigaraki was able to revive the euphoria that he initially considered taboo in his childhood. Without fear of being happy, he uses the full potential of his quirk. He is free. Upon witnessing Tomura's freedom, Redestro perceives his excitement. He notices Shigaraki's happiness in using his power. The enthusiasm and elation on the boy's face are contagious. It's as if he's embracing Destro's ideals while celebrating his special ability. This captivates Redestro, which leads him to have an epiphany. Just as Rika accidentally freed Shigaraki from his insecurities, Shigaraki makes Rika aware of his position and frees him too. Redestro realizes that he was bound by the beliefs of his doctrine, his ancestors and his bloodline. But now he sees the truth in Shigaraki. While the Liberation Front only seeks Destro idealized freedom, Shigaraki has already achieved it. He embodies the principles that Redestro craves in a perfect society. What Rikki initially thought of as mere childishness was, in fact, the purest definition of his own ambitions. In this way, Redestro finally finds the opening to get rid of his suffering. If this young man was able to support the weight of our history so casually, then he is certainly the perfect candidate to inherit my father's ideals. Conclusion, the Metal Liberation Army is yours to command. And so, Destro's ideology is merged with the League of Villains, which results in the birth of a new group, the Paranormal Liberation Front. Tomura is recognized by Gigantomachia and gains full respect of Ujiko, all for one's private doctor. However, Shigaraki has also conquered influence in politics, the entertainment industry, an army, two if we include twice, and support item technology. Not to mention the new Nomus, an experimental high-end nearly killed endeavor, Japan's current number one hero. The surrender of Rikia Yotsubashi provided an astronomical level of hype for the future of the series. We can only hope that the other will be able to live up to those expectations. But due to the events in the latest chapters, it looks like it won't be long before we know the answer. Okay, where to start with this character? The young successor of All for One is an extremely contradictory villain if we look at him more broadly. So it's very difficult to try to understand the general motivation of his actions. In any case, it seems that the character has a special place in the other's heart. In 2007, Horikoshi published a one-shot in the Akamaru Jump magazine simply titled Tenko. I strongly recommend it, by the way, it's a good read. The story is about a boy who aims to destroy all swords during a period of war in feudal Japan. Tenko, the protagonist, has several similarities with Shigaraki, being practically a kind of prototype of the character. Beyond their name and appearance, both characters are orphans and share an inexhaustible hatred towards something. The two also have the power to disintegrate the things they touch and both have a tragic past involving the accidental death of a loved one. It's not the first time that Horikoshi has done this, he loves to recycle characters from his best works. However, when it comes to Shigaraki, the author is extremely considerate. 
Various visual elements of the original one-shot were reproduced and adapted in some way or another in Boku no Hero Academia. Apparently, Tenku is a very important character for Horikoshi, so much so that he received an entire arc to star in. Not only that, but the author began to insert themes of divinity to further emphasize the relevance of Shigaraki throughout the villain arc. First, let's try to understand these topics better. The arc literally begins with the League annihilating a religious cult, stealing the organization's valuable jewelry and belongings. Twice even starts to make jokes about religion in the course of the narrative. However, Shigaraki promises the doctor that he will show him a beautiful horizon between heaven and hell. This promise, curiously, ends up providing a very strong religious symbolism throughout the entire battle. The panel where Kizuki holds Toga in her arms, for example, is clearly a reference to Pietà, an iconic Christian art theme best known for Michelangelo's sculpture produced in the 15th century. Also, as if the drawing was not enough proof, the reporter points out that the story of Himiko will be known worldwide if the girl gives in to the Liberation Front. This is almost an explicit mention of Jesus Christ. After Shigaraki blocked Redesto's attack, his coat practically became a cloak, giving him the appearance of a dark messiah, as if he were the very angel of death. It's a way of expressing to readers how monumental this moment is for the character, and it also demonstrates the terror he represents. After all, Horikoshi's villains tend to be portrayed as true demons. From Stain's monstrous appearance to Overhaul's twisted mind, what the other wants to express here is the undeniable threat of his main bad guy. Shigaraki was chosen by All for One. He is the fallen angel who will bring chaos to the world of heroes and become the symbol of terror. The author demonstrates this visually through this arc, as if to say, from the dust we came, and to dust we shall return. It's also possible to compare the damage that Shigaraki did to Deka City with the American atomic bombing in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, I don't know if the allusion was intentional on the other's part, but if it was, then his character is significantly more frightening. The nuclear attack on Japan is undoubtedly one of the most tragic events in the history of the world. Applying any kind of visual reference to this terrible episode should be enough to cause at least some unease among the island's inhabitants. From this point of view, Shigaraki is an exceptionally evil figure for the Japanese people. He pulverized most of an entire city, causing more damage than the Battle of Kamino. As a result, Tomura proved to be a monster of destruction, and now he represents a unique nightmare. It's not the first time that the character demonstrates his potential as a terrifying villain. The hero killer himself retreated after threatening Shigaraki. His eyes are enough to install fear in people, and that is a recurring element in the series. Deku, Stain, and even Bakugo felt the scary aura of the League's leader. In the villain arc, Tomura outdid himself, and was even able to cancel Trumpet's quirk with just a glance. No wonder Giganto Maka saw the intimidating countenance of his master in Shigaraki. The character literally wants to destroy the world. His motivation is the most classic example of villainy we could have. And yet, that's exactly what makes him the perfect antagonist for Deku. Shigaraki is guided simply by his hatred and seeks nothing but pure destruction. He is basically the personification of evil, just as Deku is the personification of heroism. Well, again, at least for the series standards. Anyway, it's precisely his attitude that makes him terrifying. The character in question was undoubtedly created in order to frighten the reader, but that's not all. Tomura's development as a character is irrefutable. Whether it was for the best or the worst, then it depends on the opinion, but it's impossible to deny his evolution. Horikoshi expresses this in several ways, from changing the texture of the character's speech bubbles to the visible alteration of his hair color. Shigaraki is also the culmination of all the themes covered during this arc. He was rejected by society, just like Toga, only to sink into the world of villainy, and it all started with a bad day, just like twice. Plus, he needs to liberate himself from his insecurities and his past, if you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, let's analyze his journey. At the beginning of the series, Shigaraki attacks Yue High School and claims his actions are justified because All Might and his students are government-sponsored instruments of violence. However, Toshinori realizes that the villain's words are a mere disguise of his true intentions. Tomura has no specific belief, all he wants to do is destroy. This lack of conviction was the character's greatest weakness at the beginning of the series. However, after being cornered by Stain, Shigaraki reveals his deepest desire – to kill All Might and end hero society. At this point, Stain mentions the existence of a vile sprout within Tomura and recognizes his potential. Unfortunately, Shigaraki was still too immature to take the hero killer's words seriously. 
What ignited the conviction he lacked, however, were Deco's words. After Midoriya linked Stain's ideals to the symbol of peace, Tomura finally understood the source of his hatred. In the end, it all comes back to All Might. Stain, Deco, they were all influenced by him. The society itself is sustained because of his presence. It's the world in which Shigaraki grew up, the one in which no one helped him when he needed it most, the world of heroes. All Might is, has always been, and will always be, his primary target. Enlightened and fulfilled, he uses the ideals left by Stain as a stepping stone and takes advantage of the convictions of others to gain strength just to fulfill his desire, to destroy all things. In any case, it's not now that Shigaraki truly succeeds in his evil plans. He fails miserably in his attempt to convert Bakugo and loses powerful allies and also gets separated from his master. Only after this tremendous fall does Tomura begin to wake up to reality. Conviction is important but not enough to lead the underworld, which is why his confrontation with Overhaul is so important. At each encounter with a new villain, Shigaraki is challenged, questioned, and consequentially taught indirectly. Again, Tomura takes advantage of the ideals of others to achieve his goal. With Stain, he acquired vigor, and with Overhaul, patience. Chisaki taught him the importance of planning, strategy, and calculation. Only after understanding this does Shigaraki formulate a coup to end Overhaul's plans, thus achieving his first triumphant victory. However, after witnessing the relationship between Chisaki and his subordinates, Tomura also discovered the value of a fundamental element in leadership – compassion. The feeling of equality and mutual respect between the members of the League is something that has been growing since the imprisonment of All for One. However, the Overhaul arc is a turning point. It is precisely in this arc that there is a collective understanding of the gang that they need to work together and in harmony. The League's safety was in the hands of Shigaraki. One false move and he could compromise everything they've built, or in this case, destroyed. It was only in this situation that Tomura really learned to value his small family. Well, since we got this far, is Shigaraki finally able to lead the underworld? Nope. The real challenge starts now. All the knowledge Tomura acquired throughout the arcs were extremely important for his growth, but in the end, he has achieved nothing so far. Even after ruining Overhaul's group, the League had to bear with the consequences for not joining the organization. The gang was in a critical situation and needed help. The time has come to test Shigaraki. There is still an essential ingredient for the character to become the greatest villain in Japan. And that is merit. And this time, he won't be able to rely on the ideologies of any other villain. To prove his worth, Tomura will need to overcome this obstacle alone. The Metal Liberation Army arc is the final test of his villain academy. And it all started when Ujiko interrogated Shigaraki about his true purposes. After all, why would he help someone who was only partially able to fulfill his goal and get rid of the symbol of peace? Only then does Tomura voice his ambition. He longs for much more than just a throne, as he was educated by All for One and grew up believing in the fusion of hate and delight as the purest definition of freedom. Even if he destroys All Might and the Hero Society, his anger will never entirely disappear. So the only possible solution is to destroy everything. From this point of view, what Shigaraki seeks is in fact something very simple and ironically very human. Freedom. He just wants to be free. However, to achieve such freedom, he will first need to get rid of all the things he hates. And what does he hate? All. Oh. How can anyone be so human and inhuman at the same time? It's so controversial that it ends up providing the character with an enigmatic beauty. For me, this is what makes Shigaraki such an interesting villain. Tomura rejects those who claim to be serving a greater purpose because for him, everyone is, in fact, just making excuses to get rid of the things they hate. If we look at it from this angle, Tomura is a purist villain, free of ideologies. His goal is so simplistic and versatile that he was able to enchant even the leader of the Liberation Front, Redestro. Shigaraki also confirmed that he is willing to morph his ways so that his allies are comfortable in the world in which he intends to create. Anyway, it's just like he said at the end of the arc. All these details are just part of the script, and therefore are irrelevant. Conviction, planning, and empathy are also part of these details. After everything is destroyed, he doesn't really care what happens next. It's kind of suicidal, isn't it? Shigaraki's few words were enough to satisfy the doctor's expectations. Now he just needed to win the approval of Gigantomachia. And we all know how this story ended. 
Tomara is a very weird villain, for sure. The character itself is not charismatic at all, as he takes advantage of the ideologies of other bandits to shape his gang, which makes him a true parasite. He collects the best qualities of the villains he encounters so that in the end, he can become the greatest of them all. He is, without a doubt, a distorted version of Deku, whose development also consists of using the teachings of other heroes to forge his own identity. Conceptually, I imagine that the villain arc is the culmination of Tomura's trajectory as a character. What will happen from here on out will simply be the consequences of the path he has taken. However, I may be wrong. Everything will depend on what the other wants to do with his villain. But considering that Shigaraki is a very privileged character, I think Horikosha has big plans for him. Only time will tell. And with that, I conclude my analysis. God, it was a lot of work to organize it all. Anyway, the villain arc was quite a read for me, full of surprises and twists. I felt that the League completely outshined the Liberation Front, which impressed me a lot. Destro's ideology is already interesting in itself, and in addition, the small provocations in the course of the work were creating a very high expectation about the character, which only made fans more anxious to meet the villain. So I would never imagine a scenario where the League could stand out more than the army that was so foreshadowed in the course of the series. Perhaps this is because Shigaraki's group literally introduced the concept of quirk evolution. Okay, it could be argued that this happened actually for the first time in the arc prior to this, where the revelation of Deku's six quirks occurred, but honestly, I feel like Horikoshi was still too shy to admit what he had done so far. It was only in the villain arc that he came to rub on our faces and admit his decisions. A childish way to justify Midoriya's development, but well, <laughs> it worked, at least for now. Boku no Hero Academia never ceases to amaze me. The series started out as a very generic and naive shonen, but is now exploring very interesting topics like society, family, freedom, equality, and madness. Within the context in which it finds itself, the arc of the League of Villains is one of the best constructed in the entire series. I think it's already possible to realize how much I fell in love with it. It was really a delight to read, and I can't wait for what the work will bring us next. Shonens are silly stories to pass the time, simple but fun, and this series is no exception. However, it's great when our favorite authors are capable to demonstrate why we love reading their stories so much through their art.